Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing Wellbeing Series. I'm Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer, the founder and director of the center. And as Molly said, for nearly three decades, we've been advancing health and well-being in people, organizations, and communities. And we are so delighted to be hosting as our well-being speaker today, Andrew Schulman, who will share his presentation, Medical Musician, a Storyteller and Sound. If you joined us for the webinar today, it's likely that you believe in or have experienced the power of music to calm, energize, inspire, and heal. Over the past two decades, music has been found to have powerful effects on our health and well being. Studies show that music can reduce stress levels, improve moods, increase energy levels, reduce pain levels, and even speed up recovery time from injury or illness. In healthcare settings, I've had experiences witnessing firsthand the power of music, both when applied as a therapeutic intervention, as well as within music therapy. Music can have a powerful benefit on not only patients, but families and caregivers as well. During today's presentation, Andrew Schulman, an accomplished professional guitar player, and a medical musician who will explore the healing power of music in critical care units. Arts and healing has been a topic of exploration and focus at the center almost since our very inception. We've offered many academic courses, community offerings, and even conducted research focused on music, the arts, and well being. We deeply understand that the arts can truly help us flourish. Today's free lecture is made possible through the generosity of our university sponsors and individual donors. Thank you for your commitment to the health and well-being of people in Minnesota and around the world. So a little bit about Andrew. In July 2009, when on the third day of lying in a coma in the surgical intensive care unit in Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City, Andrew Schulman believes that his life was saved by the music of J.S. Bach, played via his iPod. The power of music to heal was made manifest, and it inspired him to give back with his guitar. Once recovered, he received permission to return to that same ICU as a musician where he worked from 2010 to 2016. Andrew is a professional guitarist based in New York City with multiple appearances at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, the Royal Albert Hall, and other famous concert halls around the world. Since April 2020, he's been the visiting artist, medical musician in the Arts and Humanities program at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He is co-founder of the Medical Musician Initiative and the author of Waking the Spirit, A Musician's Journey's Healing, Body, Mind, and Soul. Additionally, he's currently writing a novel about the power of music to heal. Maybe we'll hear about, a little bit about that as well. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, oh, hello, Mary Jo and Molly and... Um, Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here today to talk about the power of music as medicine and critical care units. I'm not gonna give you a lot of facts and figures. I'm just gonna tell a few stories. First though, I'm going to play one of the most effective pieces I have used as musical medicine in my 10 years of playing in ICUs. It's called Little Theme in D, written by a man named Peter Williams, who was a medicinal chemist for most of his career, but a very fine amateur musician. He wrote this little piece and sent it to me and thought it might work well in the ICU, and it did. Here it is now.
I'll tell you more about this music a little bit later. So here is my story of how I became a medical musician. You already know some of it from what Mary Jo said, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. It was uh, in late June 2009, and I got a phone call from a doctor the day after an MRI telling me I had pancreatic cancer. He actually said 100% cancer and that I needed a surgeon immediately. My wife, Wendy, had gone through breast cancer surgery the year before, and she called her doctor who recommended a pancreas specialist. A few days later, we met with him, and after looking at the scans, he concurred. It was cancer. What I remember most of that visit is that before we left his office, he told me that the statistics were that I had a 3.8% chance of living two more years. For the next two weeks, waiting for the surgery, I walked my two dogs, yellow labs named Dolly and Paco, in nearby Riverside Park, contemplating the end of my life. I was 57 then. I also went to the gym every day, and while on the rowing machine, I listened to Bach's St. Matthew Passion, my favorite piece of music, which was very comforting. And on the night before the surgery, I thought about a book to take with me to the hospital. On my bedstand were some detective novels by Rex Stout, featuring the genius detective Nero Wolf that I was planning to read. The first was called Might As Well Be Dead, which didn't have quite the vibe I was looking for. The second, though, seemed perfect. Not quite dead enough. That's the one I took. The surgery took place in Beth Israel Hospital in Lower Manhattan, and when it was over, the surgeon went down to the waiting room to see Wendy. He had a big smile on his face and some really great news. They had done a frozen section pathology of the tumor in the middle of the operation, and miraculously, it was benign, as he explained to her. Sometimes even a 100% diagnosis is wrong, though rarely. But Wendy's joy turned to fear when the doctor's beeper went off and he told her that he was being summoned to the surgical ICU. Something had gone wrong. He had to get upstairs immediately, stat, as they say. He told her to go to the waiting room near the SICU, as they call it, and he'd meet her there when he could. Now, here's what happened. When they finished sewing me up in the OR and put me on the gurney, I was fine. But within a minute, my blood pressure, blood pressure plummeted. And if your blood pressure drops enough, your heart stops. I was in danger of becoming a code blue, cardiac arrest. There was a mad dash for the SICU, but two minutes before we got there, my heart stopped beating. I had no blood pressure or respiration. I was clinically dead. Fortunately for me, Beth Israel had a great SICU team. They resuscitated me and put me into a medically induced coma, which they do to buy time to figure out what's going on and to preserve brain function. As far as brain function, I was already in trouble. My chart shows that I was in brain ischemia for 17 minutes, meaning not enough oxygen to the brain, so brain damage was almost certain. As it was, as one nurse put it to me much later, I was a mess. I flatlined a second time that night and for the next two days there was one crisis after another. Not a single doctor or nurse in that unit thought I was going to survive this. The director of the SICU, Dr. Marvin McMillan, actually said in a staff meeting, this guy is toast. Now we get to the third day at noon and my lactic acid number is 17. I love telling this to doctors and nurses. Their eyes pop out because normal is 1.8 and most people don't survive 10. We'll never know if I had five minutes left, 30 minutes, an hour, but I was dying. I later learned that right then the nurses were talking about a Christmas tree and a widow. A Christmas tree because when a patient is in such dire condition, they make a last-ditch effort 
There are two or three aluminum stands filled with bags of medicine, anything that may turn the tide, and they call that a Christmas tree. The word widow was spoken because the SICU director, Dr. McMillan, always told his nurses to get him when a patient is on the precipice, and he's going to have to give what he called his black bunting speech to the widow. It was just then that Wendy had an epiphany. She had looked in her bag for her cell phone and saw my iPod, and the light bulb went off. She turned to the attending physician and said, my husband loves music more than anything. His heart is beating, but his soul isn't. I believe only music can give him the will to live. She asked if she could put my iPod in, and he said yes. She could have 30 minutes, but if there was any sign of agitation, the music had to stop. So, the earbuds went in, but she didn't know what to play, so she just, <coughs> she just clicked the first track. And what was it? Bach BWV 244, the St. Matthew Passion. I'm often asked if I heard the music. I did. There's something called coma dreams. They're not real dreams, but hallucinations, often based on what is going on around you. In my coma dream, I'm going to visit the widow who I play for every Christmas. Though I was wearing a heavy coat, I was so cold and very, very tired. I knocked on the door and the widow opened it. She was a woman in her 80s, red hair faded, tears in her blue eyes. Later, I would remember this dream and know it was Wendy, 40 years later. We go into the living room. She sits in a chair against the wall. I sit in the middle of the room. But I'm so tired, I can barely lift the guitar out of the case. And when I finally do, I don't have the energy to play. I close my eyes. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the most beautiful music. And I was bewildered. Where is it coming from? I opened my eyes, looked down, and saw my hands moving on my guitar. The music was coming from me. Now. I was even more bewildered. How could I be playing music I'd never heard before? I'll quickly add here that because it was a coma dream, which distorts reality, I didn't realize it was the St. Matthew Passion. But what matters is that all of a sudden, I felt warm, and I felt stronger, and I smiled. And then the dream faded away to be replaced by the next one. What was happening in the real world, all recorded in my medical chart, is that as the music continued to play, I stabilized for the first time in three days. My heart rate and blood pressure, which had been all over the place, returned to normal rates and steadied out. My kidney function improved, and the lactic acid, which was killing me, started leaching from my tissues. In short, the music reversed the metabolic process that would have killed me in not much more time. As all the doctors and nurses attested to later, the music literally saved my life. For years after, the nurses called it the St. Matthew Miracle. Now here's an insight into how the St. Matthew Passion could have had such an effect. Yes, it was absolutely my favorite piece but it's more than that. Dr. Lewis Thomas was known as the poet philosopher of medicine. He wrote a column for the New England Journal of Medicine called Notes of a Biology Watcher. He ended one of his essays this way. If you want, as an experiment, to hear the whole mind working all at once, put on the St. Matthew Passion and turn the volume all the way up. That is the sound of the whole nervous system of human beings all at once. I love that phrase. And by the way, for those of you who might want to listen to the St. Matthew Passion, get a recording. My favorite recording, which I had with me, was the one conducted by Leonard Bernstein with the New York Philharmonic and a host of great singers.
Anyway, I stabilized, but I didn't wake up. They kept me in the coma for three more days to play it safe. And I never regressed. There were no more crises. It was on the seventh day that I awoke. Wendy arrived at 8 a.m. and I said, Hi, Wendy. Her smile was a once in a lifetime smile, especially because I recognized her, didn't have slurred speech. There was no sign at all of brain damage. She sat down and said, your surgery wasn't yesterday. It was eight days ago. You went into shock, but they saved you. And most important, you don't have cancer. She didn't yet want to tell me about the music. She didn't think that I would be able to handle that at this point. Well, I was speechless for about a minute. Wendy always likes to say that was the longest she ever saw me speechless. But during that minute, I could see very sick people in beds nearby. I heard moans and groans, and I made a decision. I turned to her and said, with what happened to me, you can't thank God enough or your doctors and nurses or your loved ones. To give thanks, you have to give something. I knew I didn't have money to donate, but I had something else. I turned to Wendy and said, this room is really gloomy. This place needs music. I'm going to come back here with my guitar. Well, a lot of things that I found fascinating over the next few days happened in the SICU, and I'll share just one of them with you now. On my second day, now remember, I'm still in the coma. Uh, oh, actually, no, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a story. This is uh, when I'm out of the coma. It's the second day out of the coma, and it was in the afternoon. I was resting and Wendy was reading a book. Then I heard something and started laughing. Wendy turned to me and said, what's so funny? I said, now I know who the jazz musician was. She laughed, but looked very puzzled, and I explained. One of my recurring coma dreams was that I was sitting outside a jazz club on 8th Avenue and 55th Street, looking in the window. It was always at 4 a.m. in the dream. There was a pianist, and every time I was there, he played the same music, which I thought of in the dream as minimalist music. Very strange, but I liked it. I'll play for you now the two short melodies he always played. So, who was the jazz pianist? It wasn't a pianist. It was the warning beeps from the ventilator machines, which are all over the unit. I just heard one of them going off at a nearby bed, and I put two and two together. And I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that a patient in a coma hears everything. If you are ever uh, visiting a loved one, in an ICU and that loved one is in a coma. Be very careful of what you say. So continuing now, the doctors thought I'd be in the hospital for about two months, but I left on the 12th day. I was on a mission, I was on fire. As we left the hospital, we stopped off to see Dr. McMillan who had seen me, but I had not seen him because he'd gone off duty before I woke from the coma. We chatted a few minutes, and then he gave the classic hospital farewell. We're delighted you're doing so well and never want to see you again. But my response was fierce. I was determined to return. He'd heard my recording of Here Comes the Sun on one of my CDs Wendy had given him. And fortunately for me, that would lead to his decision to let me return to the SICU with my guitar, even though I had absolutely no formal training at all in music and medicine, not even informal training. It was on the second day after I got home that I discovered, unfortunately, 
that I did have brain damage and in only one area, the music part of my brain. I had bilateral damage to the hippocampus, the part of the brain involved in forming, organizing, and storing memories. That damage is a fairly common result of brain ischemia. As a result, I'd lost the memory of 12 hours of music and could no longer memorize music. But I just accepted my fate. I would have to read music from now on but I was determined to continue as a musician. It was about six months later that I called Dr. McMillan. He was happy I had followed up and told me that I would have to call the director of the hospital's music therapy department, the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine, one of the finest in the world. I made an appointment to meet with Dr. Joanne Lowy, herself a leading expert in the field. Fortunately, when I played for her, it turned out to be a Bach prelude that was one of her all-time favorite pieces. Many of you will recognize it, and it's actually the prelude that's in the prologue of my book, Waking the Spirit. It begins... I was home free. I can tell you that really made all the difference. The result of that talk was that she decided to take a chance with me and allow me to return as a musician to the SICU, the unit with the sickest people in the hospital. Lowy was extremely helpful in helping me get started. Among the many things she said that first day was something that really moved me. When I said I was concerned that she and her team wouldn't accept me because I wasn't a music therapist, she just said, you'll learn from us and we'll learn from you. I'll never forget that kindness. So six months after my surgery, I returned to the SICU at Beth Israel Hospital. I'm gonna play something for you now, another piece I've used many times as musical medicine. There is a famous melody Bach used in the St. Matthew Passion five times based on the hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. I had a wounded head, so it was a natural for me to arrange it for guitar. By the way, Paul Simon based his song, American Tune, on this melody, giving it an added resonance in a modern ICU. Bach. As I've mentioned, I had no formal training in music and medicine, but the first three years that I was in this SICU were the best training I could have had, hands-on training. I was in an ICU with the medical team that, along with the music, had saved my life. I had a million questions, and there was always someone who would provide answers. I'll cut forward now to the end of the third year. It was at this time that I started calling myself a medical musician. I wasn't a music therapist, so what was I? I was a professional musician and a team member in an ICU using music as medicine, and it just came to me, medical musician. I'll give you a picture now of the method I developed for each session in the ICU. In some ways, it's simple, in others, 
Not so simple. The first thing you do when you enter the unit, I learned this from Dr. Lowy, is you walk around and just get a sense of the room. What is going on in the ICU today? The range is huge. An ICU is a room of life and death. Next, I would go to a quiet place, often the nurse's lounge in the back, and tune up. Having the best sound for your instrument is crucial. After that, I would go to the main computer monitor behind the nurse's station and spend a few minutes, as long as it takes, to look at the vital signs for each patient. Heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and oxygenation. I would do a form of triage, going to the sickest patients first. And if someone was in a coma, I would want to start with them based on my own coma experience. It's also when I'm in the nurse's station that a nurse or a doctor may ask me to go to their patient, but once you're accepted as a member of the medical team, they mostly trust your judgment. Once this review is finished, the next step is to do a slow promenade through the unit while you're playing, so the patients who are able to can see you and hear you. I have a guitar strap. I can walk and play. I may not be able to walk and chew gum, but I can walk and play. Anyway, this is a crucial step. I'll play just a, a few measures of the tune that I always use, an etude from the early 19th century that I learned as a little boy and had just the right sound to entice people to want to hear music. <laughs> lovely little tune by Carcassi. So this turned out to be a crucial step to do the promenade. Earlier on, I'd sit at the nurse's station and play, and nurses would ask patients if they wanted music. Maybe 20% would say yes. But if they heard you and saw you as you walked around playing, it went up to about 80%. When the promenade was finished, I made the decisions of where to go first. Of course, if a patient or a caregiver or a doctor or a nurse asks you to go to a particular bedside, you just do that right away. You go where they want you to play. Once you are at the bedside, you rely on intuition as to what to play. Most patients in an ICU are not able to make requests, and even if they can, they'd rather not. They're on a lot of medications, they haven't had normal sleep, they are very stressed out. They don't want to have to make decisions, although there are always exceptions to that, in which case, then you do your best to play what the patient wants. What you do as a medical musician is you develop a repertoire of what I call penicillin pieces. For me, that's a mixture of classical and popular music, mostly in medium tempos, corresponding to the human heartbeat, and mostly in major keys. I also learned early on about what music therapists call entrainment. It's a complicated thing to describe. It's a term from physics. So I'll just say for now that entrainment is the synchronization between the patient and the musician, and it's the key to effectiveness. I learned to create that synchronization by playing music that tells a story. In other words, is evocative. That's why I say a medical musician is a storyteller in sound. I would play, and the patient and I would journey together into the world of that music. In essence, you are telling bedtime stories. And if you can get a patient to fall into a deep sleep, you're doing one of the best possible things for them, because getting sleep is a major problem for patients in an intensive care unit. When you play at the bedside, you concentrate almost completely on the patient, watching the face, hands, and feet, mostly looking for signs of agitation, which would mean you need to change the music, and also on the vital signs monitor to see if you're helping heartbeat, blood pressure, etc. Therefore, you have to be very secure in your playing because you can't concentrate on your instrument. It's all about the patient. Okay, until now, I focused on medical music for patients. But there are actually three constituencies in an ICU, the patients, the caregivers, who are primarily friends and family, and the medical team. 
music can make a world of a difference for the caregivers. The music I started this talk with, The Little Fame in D, is a perfect example of that. I can't go into the music details right now, but that piece is filled with hope and at the same time an awareness of the gravity of the situation. It's very simple. Music can bond a group of people together in a way better than anything else available to them in an ICU. I have played Little Fame in D hundreds of times when loved ones sat around a patient who might live or die, when they are all in a state of fear and anxiety, and each time the music has given that small group something to connect them in a way that nothing else in the ICU can do. As far as the medical team, ICU staff live with great pressure and stress every single day. ICU burnout is a major problem in all hospitals. I am a member of the Society of Critical Care Medicine and uh, in 2017, the year I joined, I was invited to do a talk at a burnout conference in Chicago. Um, and um, I was very happy to be able to convince a lot of people that having a medical musician in an ICU will help, especially for burnout. Now, most of the staff in the ICUs that I've played in have had their special piece of music. For Dr. McMillan, it was Here Comes the Sun. For one of the nurses, it was Besame Mucho, and so on. It was a pleasure for me to play what made them happy. When I would see them under a lot of stress, I would play their music for them, and the relief it gave them was palpable. Having a strong relationship with the medical staff is absolutely vital. If they don't accept you as a fellow healer, it won't work. Here's a little story of one example of how I became a team member to a particular nurse. It was in January 2016 when I began a monthly residency with the title of Medical Musician at Berkshire Medical Center in Massachusetts, where Dr. McMillan had taken a position as critical care director. On my first day there, when I walked into the ICU with my guitar and began my promenade, a nurse walked up to me demanding to know what I was doing there, with a guitar no less. McMillan came over and he explained, but she remained very negative. She was still that way in the first three months that I made visits. It was in the fourth month on my first day back that I happened to play for one of her patients with a very high blood pressure. It was 160 dangerously high for a critical Ill, critically ill patient. 20 minutes later, it was back down to the 120s. I should say here that medical music is often very, very effective with high blood pressure. In fact, I've always felt that of the different things I have to do in the unit, that's almost the easiest. I glanced at this nurse and her expression was still highly skeptical. She wasn't buying it, that the music was the cause of the improvement. Next day, it was another of her patients, also blood pressure in the 160s, and 20 minutes later, it had come down into the 120s. I glanced at her, and now I could see she was thinking. Third day, and this is the only time this has happened this way in all the years I've been playing in ICUs, it was another one of the patients of the same nurse with a blood pressure in the 160s, and 20 minutes later, it was in the 120s. This time, the nurse walked over to me, leaned in, and said, Andrew, could you go to bed too now? Yes. She had finally accepted me as a team member, and that's as it should be. The medical musician has to prove that they are helping the patients. You need to show that, but if you do, you're on the team. In my years as a musician in ICUs, I've played for thousands of patients. Here's a brief account of one of my favorite stories. It's in my book, Waking the Spirit, in a chapter called Alice Blue Gown. One day, as I entered the unit, I saw a patient in bed seven she was in her 60s, eyes swollen shut, hair on one side of her head shaved, skin very pale, no movement. 
She was wearing a blue hospital gown and her last name began with the letter A, which is why I called her Alice Blue Gown, after the old song by that name. A second year resident I knew well told me she'd, have a mass, she'd had a massive stroke and there was very little hope for her. They weren't sure if she had actually any cognitive function left at all. In these cases, the patient often goes into an acute care facility where they are warehoused until they die. I decided to go to her first. Her heart rate and blood pressure were high, but as I played, they began to come down. And as all the other patients that day were in pretty good shape, I decided then and there to just play for her that day. After about 45 minutes, I took a short break and walked over to talk to that young doctor. And as we chatted, we both heard a noise. It was her making a gasping sound. And although her eyes remained closed, her face began to redden and her vital signs shot up. I looked at the doctor and I said, could it be that the music stopped and why it's happening? And he said, it might go back to her. And I did. I went back to her bedside and began to play and she settled down immediately. I played another 45 minutes and then it was time to go. Other than that agitation and the change in her vital signs, there was no sign that she was home, so to speak. When I was packed up, I went over to her, leaned in and said, Mrs. A, I enjoyed playing for you today. Then immediately, there were two beeps sounding from the intracranial pressure monitor she was attached to, which startled me. Had she understood what I'd said? I went over to one of the nurses nearby, Rosie, a nurse who had taken care of me when I was a patient, and I explained the situation and asked if she thought it was possible this woman was still functioning inside. Rosie, who is a great nurse, said, let's see. She went over to Alice, took her hand, leaned in and said, Mrs. A, did you like the music? If you did, squeeze my hand. We waited five, 10, 15 seconds, nothing. And then it happened. Her hand slowly tightened. However, I knew that this might just be a reflex reaction and Rosie knew it too. So she asked another question. Mrs. A, if you want the musician to return tomorrow, give me a thumbs up. The seconds ticked by, 5, 10, 15, 20, longer. Nothing happened. I was ready to give up hope. Yes, it was a massive stroke. No one was home. I was foolish to think and hope otherwise. I felt that was the big lesson for me that day be realistic. And then we looked carefully at her hand that Rosie was still holding. And Alice's hand slowly, slowly, slowly turned. And as slowly, her thumb went up. Rosie and I were beside ourselves. We were overjoyed. And that actually was the biggest lesson of my time as a medical musician. Never give up hope. And it was also a sign that something Oliver Sacks, the famous neurologist and author of Musicophilia, once said, nothing activates the brain so extensively as music. That's a scientific fact, ladies and gentlemen. And the day after I played for her, I returned to the unit to hear her neurologist tell another doctor that she was puzzled by the sudden improvement in her condition. Was it the music? I can't prove it, but I do believe it made all the difference for her. And she did make it enough of a recovery that she did not go into an acute care facility. She had some of her life back. Here's one more story a patient story from the SICU. This one is about a man I called my English patient. It's from the Wild Horses chapter in my book. I was playing near the nurse's station one day when a very elegant woman with an English accent approached me. 
She told me her name was Trudy, and she reminded me of my mother, who about the same age. She said she was enjoying my music and told me that her son was in bed for and that he loved music. She then told me his situation. He'd had a surgery, there were major complications, and he was in a medically induced coma. Would I, she asked, come to his bedside? Of course, I said, and we went to him right then and there. That was the first time I played for Elliot Bernard. I can say his name because he's given me permission to use it in the book and when I do these talks. Elliot was quite a music lover with a broad range of interests. A former chairman of the London Philharmonic Orchestra and a friend of Mick Jagger to boot. Long story short, his condition kept worsening. At the end of the following week, when I entered the unit, Trudy came over to me full of anxiety. Elliot was at the precipice, she said. She was so nervous. And then she asked me, could I bring my guitar right away? It so happened that day that I had with me a book I'd bought the day before, a book of all the Rolling Stones songs. As I got the guitar and the music out, it came to me, what to play. One of the best Stone songs is Mick Jagger's favorite, I've heard, Wild Horses. One of the lines came to me as I walked towards his bedside. Wild horses couldn't drag me away. Wherever Elliot was in that moment, I wanted to him to hear that. I wanted him to believe that wild horses could not drag him away from his life, from his mother, from his loved ones. With me at the bedside was Trudy, the attending physician, and a nurse. I began the beautiful guitar intro to the song, which leads to that very poignant melody. It's a long song, six minutes. I played it twice. It was one of the most powerful moments of my life. What the St. Matthew Passion did for me, Wild Horses did for Elliot. It pulled him back to life. He stabilized. His vital signs changed significantly for the better. The music saved him as it had saved me. But that's not the end of the Elliot Bernard story. The following day, they brought him out of the coma and I continued playing for him for another week. One day, he had to be brought down to the radiology department for a scan, but there was a foul up and he was left lying on the transport gurney just outside his room for about 10 minutes. He'd been very upbeat since coming out of the coma, but with this minor setback, it was finally all too much. He just looked terribly depressed. An idea came to me of the exact music to play for him. When they got the go-ahead for him to leave the unit, I waited until his gurney was just with a few feet of where I was sitting, and this is what I played. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. I can't get no satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. He loved it. As he rolled past me, he threw his arms in the air, kicked off his blanket, and that day, our little rock concert lifted the spirits of the whole unit. And I say this, only a musician is the team member in an ICU that can create that kind of exuberance, and it benefited everybody, all the patients, all the staff. Now, I'm going to finish this part of my talk and say this. I've shared some exhilarating stories of music and medicine with you, but it is far from always exhilarating. As I've said, an ICU is a room of life and death. And no matter how much you try, you can't save a terminally ill patient with medicine or music. The most difficult thing I had to learn in my first years was how to cope with the sadness you feel when people who you'd formed a relationship with died in the unit. But even here, there is comfort. I have always felt that the greatest grace a musician can have is to play beautiful music for someone in their final moments, especially in an ICU. Instead of the only sound being the beeps of medical machines and the voices of people nearby doing their jobs, I have been so fortunate as to be able to ease the way with soothing melodies and harmonies. I'm very grateful to have had that chance to help a fellow human being pass through that ultimate reality. 
Well, now in this last part of my talk, I'm going to finish with a little bit about this thing called music and medicine. That is the general name given to the big tent filled with music people who help heal the sick. The core profession since 1950s, uh, uh, the core profession since 1950 has been music therapy. To learn more about that, I suggest you go to the website of the American Music Therapy Association. It's a great website. In 1994, another organization arose the Music for Healing and Transition program, which trains people to be certified music practitioners, CMPs. There is also the Clinical Musician Certification Program, which is through a program called Heart for Healing, and it's open to most instruments. And there are a number of other specialties in music and medicine, which you can easily Google. In 2018, I co-founded the Medical Musician Initiative which focuses on training professional musicians to be members of the medical team in ICUs. As with so many others, our workshops were stopped by the pandemic, but we're hoping to continue them, continue them when that's possible. A question you may have is, is all of this medical music a new thing? No. Medical music is actually one of the oldest healing therapies in human civilization. All ancient civilizations had music as a core modality in their healing techniques. One of the best examples is in the Old Testament, the story of young David playing his harp for King Saul, who was, <clears throat> as the Bible describes, tormented by evil spirits, probably a deep depression. His advisors sought out someone who knew how to play well to heal him, and that was David. I started playing the guitar when I was eight years old, and that was my favorite Bible story as a kid, especially the part where King Saul gets those evil spirits going and throws the spear at David. But never mind, never mind. There was also uh, the famous Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. He played the kathara, an ancestor of the guitar, and founded a school for healing music. He was the first we know of to call it musical medicine. For those of you who want to know more about the history of music and medicine in different cultures, I will recommend an excellent book, Music Therapy, an Introduction by Jacqueline Schmidt Peters. This use of music and medicine lasted for thousands of years until the 18th century when European and American doctors turned much more to science. Anything that wasn't scientific got pushed out and that included the musicians. A revival of sorts started with the American Civil War. Doctors noticed that when local musicians were brought into the hospitals to play for the wounded soldiers, it seemed to have a beneficial effect. Same with the World War I. Between the World Wars, several universities started to teach about the beneficial aspects of music and in World War II, more attention was paid to music in the soldiers' hospitals. This led to the landmark conference held in 1950 that began the music therapy profession. Interestingly enough, it was science which had pushed us out and science that made a huge impact in bringing us back. In the 1980s and 90s, the advent of brain scans, especially MRIs and fMRIs, made a huge impact for us. They began to do brain scans when music was being played, and they discovered what Oliver Sacks was talking about, that music lights up the whole brain. And when the whole brain lights up, crucial chemicals are produced that help heal us. One of the leading music therapists today, Dr. Connie Tomeno, an old classmate of mine at Stony Brook University, explained what this meant in my case. She said that the music entered my brain through the auditory nerve entered the auditory cortex and then everything lit up and chemicals were produced that carried a message all through my body that it wasn't time to shut down yet. That's the best description I've ever heard. But here's the thing. Modern hospitals operate on hard data and that's been slowly evolving to prove music works as medicine. I'll read something from the prologue in my book. On August 13th, 2015, the Lancet, the leading British medical journal, published a new study that confirmed that listening to music during 
before, during, and after surgery reduces patients' anxiety, pain, and their need for painkillers. The study team, led by Queen Mary University of London, analyzed the results of 73 randomized controlled trials that looked at the impact of music on post-operative recovery, and their findings confirmed the positive link between music and lower levels of pain, anxiety, and pain medications. This was true even in cases of surgery performed under general anesthesia. The study concludes, quote, music is a non-invasive, safe, and inexpensive intervention that can be delivered easily and successfully in a hospital setting. We believe that sufficient research has been done to show that music should be available to all patients undergoing operative procedures. I can say that there have been a fair amount of studies since then, and the most recent I know of is at, was at Georgetown University Medical Center, where a study funding, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts just concluded. Physiological and neurological data has been captured from, a fi from 15 end-stage liver transplant patients and 28 health control participants. This data is now being analyzed by Georgetown University's Department of Biostatistics. The study was designed by Julia Langley, faculty director of the hospital's Arts and Humanities program, and Georgetown neuroscientist, Dr. Jagmeet Conwall. It has been a great honor for me to have been asked to record all the music for the study. They also allowed me to establish the dose and duration. The dose, the music classical and popular, was from my collection of penicillin pieces and organized into the duration, three sets, morning, noon, and night, each set comprised of five pieces and about 20 minutes in length. We hope to see the results soon, and then Dr. Conwall will write a paper about what we did. I started this talk with music, and I'll end with music. If there is a single problem that modern critical care intensivists struggle with, it's how to deal with something called ICU delirium. What happens a lot is that patients in the ICU overloaded with drugs and a very alien and inhospitable environment sink into a form of anxiety. It took years to understand how dangerous that is and what the long-term effects are. I'll recommend another book on this topic written by a friend and colleague of mine at Vanderbilt University, Dr. Wes Ely. His book is called Every Deep Drawn Breath, A Critical Care Doctor on Healing, Recovery, and transforming medicine in the ICU. As he describes in the book, one of the effective ways to deal with ICU delirium is with music. I intuited early on that you don't play happy music for severely depressed people, but you also don't play deeply sad music. There is something in between that is just right, a sound that is bittersweet. Two years ago, when I was in a bout with my own depression, something I've struggled with all my life, I wrote this piece, Elegy, an homage to one of my first music teachers. There is an old saying, physician, heal thyself. In this case, musician, heal thyself. We used it in the Georgetown study, and I'll leave it with you now.
Thank you so much, Andrew. That was um, profound, um, profound, your stories, as well as the music. Before we go into the Q&A, Andrew and I thought it would be uh, fun to ask you a question and ask you all a question and invite you to put in the chat your response. If you were going to be hospitalized, what piece of music would you put on your iPod and why? So we'd love to see some responses. If you were knew you were going to be hospitalized or have a procedure done, what kind of music would you put on your iPod? And tell us a little bit about why why you would choose that. And it's fun to just sort of see people's responses and what they're drawn to. Anything from James Taylor, How Great Thou Art. Wagner. Ah, Jimmy Buffett's entire music catalog. <laughs> J.S. Bach, Gershwin. Michelle, Michelle by Paul McCartney. Fiddler on the Roof. So that's really fun to see all of the various things that come up. Well, Andrew, um, are you ready for some questions? That truly, truly was amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I love questions. So one of the first questions I want to ask you, and you you kind of answered it a bit because you were talking and you gave us such great citations for um, the research and the fact that really over the last decade, there's been incredible research on the power of music and, and health benefits. But one of our um, uh, people asks, can you see this being beneficial in other settings, musical interventions outside of the hospital settings? Are you aware of other examples of where that has been used? Well, um, I would refer this person who's asking the question to the uh, website I mentioned before, the American Music Therapy Association website. Music therapists, uh, again, they're the core profession in this field of music and medicine. They, they have to go to a university program, which is a four-year program. Most of them do masters, many do PhD. And they are trained in an incredibly wide variety of situations to use music to help people. That's The, the basic idea is it's using music to improve somebody's life in all kinds of different ways. So um, now most people, not everybody, but most people, most of us, we use music every day to improve our life by just putting the radio on or whatever it is that we're listening to. Um, and I, I'll take this opportunity also to say in terms of what music does in our daily life, Imagine going to a movie and uh, there's no soundtrack. <laughs> you know, what a difference that would make. Music is so important and, and the, the, the value of music and the soundtrack, think of the soundtrack to um, Lord of the Rings, one of the really great soundtracks, or the soundtrack to all the Harry Potter movies. What a difference music makes in our lives. So therapeutically, yes, there are if if you're talking about outside of the hospital situation and you wanted to work with somebody um uh there are uh, music therapists who handle a very broad range of things outside yeah. of the hospital well andrew thank you for um for sharing that information and also for differentiating you know what you do you know um in comparison to you know music therapists 
um, a music therapist um, who used to be in the Twin Cities and now is over at Oxford University is Dr. Annie Heiderscheid. And Annie would always talk about um, both the role of music therapists and music-based interventions. And one of the first studies she did, and she was at the Bakken Center at the time, was a study that focused on nurses helping to um, give patients music through their iPods on playlists that a music therapist had helped to curate. And so there's all kinds of ways I think interdisciplinary teams can work together. Um, it, music outside of hospital settings, the, the one example I can give is um, music thanatology. So music when people are dying. And that is actually being brought into hospices um, and in people's homes. And there's a project um, that came out of St. Patrick's Hospital in Missoula, Montana called the Chalice of Repose. And it was all about um, uh, people that played, I think it was harp and cello playing for people um, at the end of life. So lots of interesting examples emerging. So another question, Andrew, there's a lot of questions um, that people wanna know about can they access your music? Do you have a CD of the music you play? Somebody else wants to know um, that last piece that you wrote was phenomenal. Do you have a score and can people kind of access, you know, the, the score for that? Um, okay, two parts in this question. So the first part is um, I've recorded two CDs for the Centaur label and um, you can find them online. The first one is called the Baroque style. And it's what it sounds like. It's music from the 18th century, uh, different Baroque composers. The second one, and I think you'll like this one, Mary Jo. Second one is called Lullabies and Reveilles. Mm. And Siesta. Um, it's music that I put together years ago when a friend of mine was having a baby and she said, could you make a recording where on the first side, this is a long time ago, actually, when I first put that idea together. Can you make me a cassette where it's music to wake up in the morning with the baby and the second side is go to sleep? <laughs> so um, that was the idea for that recording. Um, I have written um, four pieces for the guitar and um, I don't write them out. They're not improvised. Every note is there, um, but I don't write them out for um, the most important reason for that is uh, I am in many ways an extremely lazy person. <laughs> and the other thing is that my music is written for the eight string guitar and very, very few people play eight string guitar. And um, uh, so the answer is no, it's not available now. I think at some point, um, uh, people have been really responding to Elegy a lot, and including a friend of mine, um, I'll mention his name. His name is Frederick Hand, who's a guitarist, and he's the greatest composer for the guitar that I know of, and he's been my friend for 52 years, and I played Elegy for him a few days ago, and Fred liked it. So if Fred liked it, I must do something with it. That's the answer to both parts of the question. Thank you for that. I'm going to build on one answer that you were giving because somebody else wrote a related question, and that is what kind of guitar does Andrew play on? Oh, okay. I'm very, very happy to give publicity to a guitar maker in Washington State named Darren Hitner. And um, this guitar that I play for you right now, amazingly enough, it's only five weeks old which is very, very unusual that a guitar that young will have that kind of mature sound. He really, really went to it for me on this guitar. And Darren has been a partner in crime with me on eight string guitars since 2004. This was the 20th eight string guitar he's built for me in 19 years. Now, and I don't keep them. I don't have 20, I, I don't have 20 guitars in a room. We were working on different um, uh, types of bracing for the guitars, different kinds of tone woods for the guitar. Um, and um, 
we finally uh, uh, got it. This number 20 is the guitar I've been waiting for all my life. So Darren Hipner in Washington State, I recommend him as a great guitar maker. Mm. So somebody asked the question, Andrew, I think this is interesting. Do you think there's a difference between recorded and live music? That's a very good question, and I'm asked that all the time. Um, I would only answer it this way. The most important thing is the quality of the sound. That's very, very important. There's a very famous writer on music named Daniel Levitin. He wrote the, uh, a very famous book called This Is Your Brain on Music. And he makes a very, very important point that the timbre of the sound you're listening to is extremely important. It's one of the reasons why guitar is so good in the ICU. A classical guitar has a naturally beautiful sound. Um, and so a live situation is very valuable also in that when the musician is sitting right at the bedside and playing live, there's a vibration thing that happens that probably uh, doesn't happen uh, from a recording. However, and this is the big however, my life was saved by a recording. <laughs> I'm never going to poo-poo recordings. And uh, the other thing is that the Georgetown study we did had to be a recording for actually there were two reasons. One of them was that the study was taking place during the pandemic, so I couldn't go to bedsides. But the other thing is, when you're playing, the music was, uh, I think it's something like close to 50 people that it was done for. The music has to be the same all the time in the study. And you, the live musician is not playing it the same all the time. You need that for the study. So um, I know in some of the hospitals where I've played, they have these very fancy new hospital beds that have uh, mu that you can turn music on, but the sound is terrible. It's really a, not only is it a waste; I think it's detrimental. The sound is just not good. They probably try fifty thousand dollars for the bed with, to to put that little speaker in there. The sound is not good. So, um, ideally, if you have an experience, if you have a team member in an ICU who's a musician, whether it's medical musician or music therapist or certified music practitioner, doesn't matter. Um, if they have a beautiful sound to the instrument and they organize their repertoire in the right way, um, uh, then that vibration that can also, the empathy that happens and, and, and the, um, it, it's extremely valuable, but a great recording, if it's produced and really great sound is also very valuable. Mm -hmm. So someone else writes, Andrew, <clears throat> that their 11th grade daughter is a cellist. And she says that she feels incredibly spiritual the moment that she stops playing and the sound is reverberating in the room. Can you explain this from what you've learned about connections to the body? It's kind of similar to what you were talking about. Um, that's a very good question. That's a very tough question. Um, the feeling of, this is just the thought that comes to my, to my mind right now. It has to do, I think probably, with what that interval, she's, she's saying that the daughter who is the cellist feels spiritual when she finishes playing? Yeah, and, and part of it, my sense from the question is part of why she feels so spiritual is that she feels like when she stops, it's as though the sound is still reverberating in the room. Right, right. Um, well, it activated something inside of her and this uh, the spiritual aspect then I think would have a lot to do with what an, a person's relationship is with spirituality, whether it's an organized religion or something that's deeply personal, that's not from a, a formal religion, uh, and has to do with the sense of, um, I think, uh, of your connection to God. Now, um, when I was in my 20s, 
I um, well, actually, I'll go. I'll take a step back further. When I was a, a, a young boy and an adolescent, I grew up in New York, in a place called Far Rockaway, part of New York City. And my family is Jewish, and we went to a synagogue. It was called Sharei Tefillah. And the cantor in that synagogue was a wonderful, wonderful singer with this deep, uh, uh, rich timbre in his voice. And he was the best legato singer I ever heard. Legato meaning singing very smoothly. The, the other thing about it, the synagogue, is that the congregation was extremely musical. And um, the singing every Saturday was incredible. I believe that's the connection that I had to the St. Matthew Passion. Because in the St. Matthew Passion, you have these soloists, but much of it is choral singing. And I grew up loving that sound. And then I also was uh, introduced to Bach at a very early age, nine years old. So I love Bach's music. Um, and uh, the in internal part of me therefore responded to that. Now I'll say one more quick little thing, which may connect to this young lady. It, this is when I was in my 20s one day, I was playing and uh, I, uh, I came up with a phrase for myself that playing is like praying mm -hmm. and praying is like playing. It's the mm -hmm. connection I made in the way I made music to a very spiritual element. Mm -hmm. Now, when I am sitting at a bedside with a critically ill patient, believe me, that is part of what's going on. Because every time I'm at a bedside, I am praying for that person's recovery. And I'm doing it especially through the guitar. Mm -hmm. Wow, Andrew, that's incredibly powerful. You know, I have a nurse colleague who works in the long-term care setting, and she is um, an incredible musician, but also has an, uh, an amazing voice. And she often sings to patients as she is caring for them. Yeah. And I think her singing, and she does that as part of being a healthcare provider, is really just part of um, the care that she provides. I just want to share with you, Andrew, because this is so touching. Um, somebody wrote in the chat, what a touching session this has been. And she writes, I was an internal, um, internal medicine physician during the COVID pandemic. I worked in the ICU and CCU. Your music and story brought back some of the most emotional memories for me. And the great synchronicity is my favorite music is St. Matthew Passion, which served as my guiding light during the darkest times in my life. I've been searching for ways to provide patients with mind, body, spirit support during severe illnesses. And your experiences have truly inspired me. I am incredibly grateful and, and uh, can't wait to um, read your book. Um, and there's lots of comments and we'll share those with you, um, Andrew, so you get a chance to see them. You know, somebody else writes, and um, why wouldn't hospitals provide music to patients in a way rather than the damaged TVs that are often very loud and discordant? And so why hasn't this movement, you know, moved even more quickly? Oh, I'm so glad that you said that. First of all, my greatest enemy in the ICU are the goddamn televisions. I hate the televisions. I want them all turned off. Uh, my hospital here in New York is Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, and they're fabulous. They now have headphones for t televisions. Um, and um, and your this question is why is it not why is music not everywhere? It's that. Um, study that was published in The Lancet that said, they concluded it saying, we believe music should be available in every hospital to every surgical patient. So here's the, the thing. 
it is not just as far as I'm concerned, but as far as a great, great many people, including many doctors and nurses are concerned, that music is powerful medicine. It was part of medicine in every culture in the world for a reason. And the reason is very simple. It works. It's very, very effective. And we are still living with what I talked about earlier, that it was in the 18th century that the doctors, the medical profession got very, very scientific. And um, they didn't consider us to be science. And that is not finished. That is not done. Now, I have a many, many times had my guitar in its case on my back as I walk into a hospital and I've seen doctors and nurses walk past me, smile and say, music, the next big thing in medicine. So I know that there are very major inroads that have been made, but not enough yet. And part of the reason is something else I said in the talk, hospitals operate on hard data. And so there has to be a proliferation of studies being done that produces the data that gets not, it's not so much the doctors, it's the hospital administrators have to buy into this. <laughs> but um, I can tell you that I am certain that if there was a medical musician in every ICU and every hospital, the um, how do I put this? The the recovery rates will be better. The patient experience will be better. The staff experience will be better. And I'll also say it's not this is not an easy job, medical musician or music therapist or me medical music practitioner. Um, it requires um, see if I can remember this in, in the medical musician initiative on our website. Um, there are four elements, which I call meta M E T A, which Mark Zuckerberg has not sued me yet for because he calls Facebook meta now, right? Uh, musicality, empathy, teamwork, and assessment. That's what's need. A real, real big one is the empathy. There are great musicians who are not empathetic. They're not going to be effective. They're just not going to be effective. Um, but, but the person also has to be very, very musical. Uh, because most people hear music recorded, whether it's on the computer or TV or the iPod, whatever, there's an expectation about sound. I pretty much have always said that to be effective, you have to sound like a CD. Because if you're not effective that way, um, uh, then uh, you, you can agitate not only patients, but staff. Mm -hmm. So that's the musicality. The empathy goes without saying. The teamwork is crucial. You have to know who you are in that unit. and. And I, I will tell you right now that in an intensive care unit, the boss is the nurse. You don't even see the doctors too much in an ICU, a little bit, but the nurse is the frontline troop. And that's the teamwork. And then the assessment is very important. You have to know how to read the vital signs monitor. You have to know how to read the patient. That took me a couple of years. The nurses read the patient. They see the patient. It's not just the numbers. Um, that's very, very important. So you have to have all of that. It's a hard job, actually, mm -hmm. but it's a great job.
You know, Andrew, somebody wrote in the chat a great practical um, uh, suggestion for a next step when you talk about the quality of music, musicality. And as a start, um, uh, Jelaine wrote, families and friends need to step up and bring in their Bluetooth speakers with their great sound quality music or their own video, use yeah. their own videos or voices and talents in the area of music. So there are things that, um, that families, um, you know, can begin to do. I also want to just share with a group that NIH, um, who funds research in this country, uh, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, has a big new initiative on music. And I think they have funded in the last few years well over $10 million in, um, in this whole area. And Johns Hopkins University has a new program in the neuro arts. And so they're studying how not only music, but other forms of art um, can be healing and kind of mapping experiences of music and art um, to changes in the brain. So as you have said a couple of times in this talk, um, so much exciting happening in the whole area of neuroscience. I'm going to ask you, Andrew, one more um, question, um, and and um, and that is: Have you ever heard of layering sound in music as a playlist to heal? For example, recording a well-known song and then layering with several layers simultaneously: children laughing, nature sounds, ambient sounds. Um, I I haven't heard it with that term, but I've heard music done that way. Okay. Yeah, I have heard music done that way. Great. So that sounds Great. very interesting to me. Well, you know, I'm going to um, want to, first of all, thank you, Andrew. This has just been incredibly um, profound. And um, I want to offer a few closing remarks. Um, but then actually, Andrew is going to play a final piece of music um, to send us off for the rest of our day. So please stay tuned for, you know, just a few more minutes. But truly, Andrew, this has been in a very, very moving um, experience, you know, and so thank you and thank everybody for joining us um, for the webinar today. I also want to thank all of our University of Minnesota sponsors who are partners in bringing you today's lecture. And I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the staff at the Bakken Center, particularly Molly Buss, who helped make um, today's webinar possible. So everyone um, plays a role in keeping these um, such um, successful events. So thank you for being with us today. And Andrew, I'm going to give you the last, I would say word, but I think it's going to be sound. Uh, I, I will play something right now. I want to uh, also put a, a word out that um, my good friend and colleague, Gen Z Silverman, um, teaches uh, courses in music and healing uh, at the Bakken Center, and she's great at it. I've, I've sat in, I've, I've Zoomed with some of those classes. So I, it's a shout out to Gen Z, uh, and, and I'm very grateful that actually she brought you to, she brought me to your attention too. So I'm gonna play, this is a tune that was the very first arrangement I ever did. And it is, this is the music, the rec my recording of this music is what Dr. McMillan heard and allowed me to um, return to his ICU. And it's the music that if you sit in the corner of an ICU and play this piece, uh, it brings a lot of sunshine into the room because it's called Here Comes the Sun.
everybody. <laughs>